You may be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ, our Lord, our gentle shepherd, who won't condemn the woman caught in adultery, who rides into Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey, who receives children, who dines with sinners and tax collectors, is the victim of betrayal, of false accusations, and of corrupt judges. He, our Lord, the one who healed the ear of Malchus and drove out demons and saved the centurion's servant, is brought by conspiracy and armed thugs, Levites, and soldiers with swords and clubs to Golgotha, the place of the skull. And that is no mere coincidence. The serpent of old, the father of lies, the prince of this world, who beguiled Eve in the garden and ushered in death, suffered this prophecy about the enmity that he brought down between the children of Eve and his own wicked underlings. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And so the nail, driven by Roman soldiers into our Lord's feet to hold him to the cross, grinds the Lord's heel into the devil's skull. And the devil is his footstool. The Lord is bruised, but not broken. He is killed, but he rises. He is crucified in the place of the skull to crush the devil's skull and end his claim upon us. And so it is that enmity, that promise millennia ago, enmity himself is on the cross in the place of the skull between us and the devil. A couple of hours earlier, Pilate had said, Behold the man. It was as if he said, He's only a man. Nothing more. Look at him. He's weak. And we can do whatever we want to him. So perhaps you Jews should have some pity. I'll beat him up. But then I'll let him go, because it's not as if he's going to amount to anything. And the priests cried out in pure malice, with demonic urging, crucify him. They aren't men. They're subhuman. They're in league with demons, and they hate God. They lack pity, and they're concerned only for their position. But we behold the man. And we rejoice because he is a man. He's one of us. He has made himself the keeper of the law on our behalf. He has done what we should have done. And he refrained from doing what we should have refrained from doing. And he will allow Pilate and the devil and the priests to do to him all the law should have done to us. And all of it in the place of the skull. Behold the man. Behold the man of sorrows. The one who was despised, stricken, smitten, and afflicted. Behold the man who is chastised for our crimes. The one who bears our burden, our guilt, who dies our death. Behold the man who loves the unlovable and unworthy, who loves you in the place of the skull. A bit later, and Pilate will drag him out again, and this time he will say, Behold your king. And the Jews say, We have no king but Caesar. We, however, are unashamed 
to have him as our king. Enthroned upon the cross, with twisted thorns for a crown, adorned with his own holy blood, we have no king but Christ. We have no law but his word. We have no hope but his sacrifice. And so if this man is not your king, then the devil is, even if you don't know it. So behold the man. Behold him on the cross. Behold your king in the place of the school. Behold your redemption, your salvation, your bridegroom. And then Pilate places the charge at the top of the Holy Cross, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. By the way, if you've ever wondered what I-N-R-I stands for, that's it. It means Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And Pilate has it written in Aramaic and Greek and Latin. He means it as an insult, and he doesn't want anyone to miss the jab. And he doesn't want anyone to miss the humor due to a language barrier. He knew that the Jewish leaders were envious of Jesus, and he wanted to show them just how petty they were since it was obvious that Jesus was no threat to Caesar. This, he says, this is what your religion leads to. It's not us. It's not our greed. It's not our desire to accumulate territory and subdue the world. It's not that that causes war. It's you. It's your religious intolerance. And he means the charge is blasphemy. And he means it to mock the prophecies. But the charge is true. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. You meant it for evil against me, but my father meant it for good. And he who sits on his throne in heaven laughs at you. He holds you in derision. And Pilate also wanted to show what Rome would do to anyone who challenged her rule. And so it goes with all the kings and rulers of the earth. They never go light on treason. And so if you go to Washington, D.C., with enough force and demand homage as the king of the Americans, our government will imprison you and may possibly even execute you. And so Pilate says to everyone who passes by, if we can do this to your king, think about what we can do to you. This is Golgotha. This is the place of the school. And it shows what Pilate really thinks to be the ultimate threat. Death. He thinks he is in control. He doesn't believe that Jesus of Nazareth has the power or authority of a king. But we don't care about Pilate, what he thinks. Just like we don't really care about Putin or Kim Jong-il or any of their successors. We don't care about what they think of us or what they may do to us. We don't fear those who can kill the body but can't kill the soul. We trust that to lose our life for Christ is to gain That to carry the cross and follow Jesus is an honor that will receive the greatest reward. The kingdom, the power and authority of our king is to forgive sins and to join us to his father. Jesus is indeed a Nazarene, as the prophets foretold. He's an outcast, despised, rejected. He's held in contempt by the powerful and wealthy. And popular, and he's easily dismissed as insignificant, weak, he's pathetic. Nothing more than some bumpkin from some holler. He's a Nazarene. He's a Samaritan. He's a known associate of tax collectors and prostitutes. And well is he crucified among thieves and murderers, numbered with transgressors, like you and me.
in the place of the skull. For there he delivers sinners from this living death and gives them paradise. He is indeed the king of the Jews. He is the son of David, but he is also David's Lord. And his kingdom extends to the ends of the earth. It isn't hemmed in by the geopolitical boundaries of men. His throne is the cross. And the sons of Korah sing us a love song of the Lord on his cross throne in Psalm 45. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And so he is our man. He is our Nazarene. He is our king. He is the redeemer of the insignificant, of the weak, of Gentiles, of sinners. And he dies our death and rises in our resurrection. So behold the Christ. Behold the anointed one of God who takes away the sins of the world, who turns the heart of his father to us. Children raised from stones, saints made out of sinners. He loves us to the end. And in so doing, the place of the school becomes the fountain of life. The cemetery is turned into a garden. For that's where Jesus is laid to rest, in a garden. Turns into a garden and a banquet. We behold him on the cross. We don't look away. Because there we see God's mercy. There we see God's love and his glory. And that is what we venerate. That's what we adore. Not the wood, not the metal, not the symbol. We don't venerate the old rugged cross. We don't cling to it. And for heaven's sake, we don't trade it in for a crown. We venerate and adore the Christ, our man, our king. We cling to Jesus Christ and him crucified. For he is the salvation of the whole world who hung upon that cross. Pilate says, behold, and we behold. And in beholding, we worship, we adore, we venerate, we rejoice. Because the ancient enemy is undone. The skull is crushed and the heel, that precious heel, that was nailed and bruised for us, rises from the dead. In Jesus' name.